Hi guys, what's going on? I'm here with Jamie today from Punch Perfect Boxing. Um, make sure you go and give Jamie a um, uh, look at his channel. Have a look at his channel. Give him a subscribe. Share his videos. Really good content. He breaks things down really well. Uh, Jamie, do you want to just give us a little insight into your channel? Yeah, firstly, thank you very much for having me, mate. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, my channel's very similar, just covering all all boxing stories. I like to do my breakdowns, um, punch perfect predictions is kind of the mainstay of the channel. And then, yeah, just covering off any news and any bits and pieces, really. Yeah, Jamie, so we've got a lot of, th a lot of things going on in know. boxing at the minute. Um, as you, you, I've seen some couple of your videos about AJ. I want to start on that because obviously that was announced this, this week that Anthony Joshua signs a two-fight deal with the zone. Um, it's worth around 100 to 120 million, apparently. What did you make of it? Um, well, obviously, what do you think as a, as guys that live in the UK? What do you, what's, how big a blow is that for Sky Sports? I think it's a blow for Sky. I, I, I do, because I do think uh, even outside of AJ, they were, they're scrambling a little bit for a pay-per-view yeah. name, I think, Sky. I think they, they want Eubank to be that guy, but they mm. haven't quite got the opponent to put him on pay-per-view yet. They were hoping it was Kell Brook and that's fallen through. So I think they were banking on AJ Usyk to yeah. be in their pay-per-view fight this summer and they're not going to have it. So it's a bit of a blow for them and they'll have to search for something else. For yeah. DAZN, I think it's a really, really good move because they were sort of similar, actually, that they didn't quite have anything to go with pay-per-view here in the UK. Yeah, They've yeah, got Canelo, yeah. but they know that unless yeah. it's a Brit against him, they can't really do it. Yeah, um, yeah. They've been trying to build up Conor Ben, trying to build up yeah. the Coley's, and again, they're just not quite there yet. So no. it's a massive deal for them and a, a deal they needed to make. Yeah. In terms of this fight, obviously, we we know that Anthony Joshua is going into a fight with Alexander Lusik, obviously, who's comprehensively beaten the first time. Um, how, do you think it's a bit of risk for, from DAZN? Because I personally think AJ will lose again to Usyk, just my mm -hmm. opinion. I'd love to know your opinion. But yeah, it's a bit of a risk because if AJ is beaten badly against Usyk, where does he really go? There are big fights out there for him still, but if he's beaten badly, his stock and his marketability will, will go down. So how, how will they, if he is to lose badly, how, how are they going to work this deal out? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I mean, especially if he loses badly, like you say, mm. if he gets beat even more convincingly than last time, and last time was pretty convincing. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's when I'm like, where does he go? If it's a similar fashion, I think AJ, yeah. I always look at someone like Derek Chisora, who yeah. no matter what performance he gives, is still involved in big fights somehow and mm. keeps being recycled. And I think Dillian White's actually going to sort of become that role as well from now on as well, that probably be wheeled out for a lot of the younger guys. Mm. So AJ will always sell, I think, enough in this country for them wanting to take the risk. But 100 million a year and multi-fight, yeah. like, that that's the bit where it's a bit like, okay, if they'd signed him to, like, a multi-fight deal on pay-per-view, like, I'd get that even if he lost. Like, mm. they could come back and make a big fight for AJ. Mm. But 100 million a year, that's a, that's a lot. That's like to get the return on that is is a yeah. lot. So, yeah, like you say, it's a massive risk. In terms of the fight itself, AJ and Usyk, obviously AJ's now got Robert Garcia in his corner. Um, how do you see the second fight? Do you think AJ can pull this off or do you think it's just a, it's not going to happen? Yeah, I just still favour Usyk again, to be honest. Um the one thing I will say is I think if it's a similar fight to last time, I think it will be closer in terms of the cards and stuff. As you mentioned, the mm -hmm. the risk for the zone and everything, I think AJ is going to get anything that goes close this yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. If it's a similar fight, it could be different. But I I don't know. I just think the, the time period is too short to really gel with a new trainer. Also, yeah. they're not really putting it into practice against a warm-up opponent or anything like that. I just think that AJ is going to be sort of learning on the job a little bit. And ultimately, once you put Usyk in front of someone, the, his opponents just tend to revert to type because they don't really know what to do with him. And I don't think AJ comes away from the first fight knowing what he needs to do this time round. Yeah. I think everyone is telling him what he think they think he needs to do, be more aggressive, be relentless, whatever it is. I just don't necessarily think he's quite built for that style. Yeah. And I don't think he fully knows himself what he fully needs for to, to go out there and win yeah i totally agree with you you know if you look at one of robert garcia's um successful fighters maidana for example 
Maidana was that way and inclined. Like he had a very good chin, very good stamina. He didn't mind taking a punch to give a punch. Um, and he had a lot of self-belief. Even when Maidana got hurt, he'd come back in fights and knock the guys out. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the, one of the most popular ones was his fight with Khan, where it was an unbelievable fight. Um, I actually think he actually even got better, Maidana, when he went with Robert Garcia, and his performance against Mayweather was unbelievable, really, especially the first fight. But do you really think AJ is built? Because Maidana was a pressure fighter, but do you think AJ, because they're saying that AJ needs to fight as a pressure fighter against Usyk. Has he got the stamina? Has he got the chin? Has he got all of those things in order to adopt that particular style? Yeah, he he doesn't. He's just not built that way. And Robert Garcia fighters, like you say, have a have a mold. They they they've got good stamina. They got good work rates. They got good engines. They come forward. It's not just Maidana. You got Jose Ramirez. If you think of yeah. Brandon Rios back in the day yeah, yeah. as well. And I know yeah. he's got some more technically sound guys like. Mikey, but Mikey works more with the dads in his sort yeah, of yeah. years of development. Bam Rodriguez is obviously a great fighter, yeah. but again, he's a little bit different to those guys. Robert doesn't have a great deal of heavyweight experience yeah. either. And don't get me wrong, that's not the be all and end all. That doesn't mean he can't train a heavyweight. But it is a factor. You, like yeah, it's, yeah. it's a completely different dynamic training yeah. a lot of 140 and 147 guys compared to a big, strong heavyweight. So yeah. I just don't think AJ, his frame is built to go out there, throw a lot of punches, have a high work rate. I think AJ's built to be explosive. I think he's yeah. built to be instinctive and snappy. And that's yeah. what he needs more than anything. So if you if you were to predict, would you think... I, I'm predicting, I think Usyk might stop him this time, to be honest with you. Because I think AJ will try getting him out of there. But I just think that will lead to Usyk hitting him more and AJ running out of steam and potentially being stopped later on in the fight. What? How do you see it? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I think Usyk's going to fight with a bit more of a tempo this time as well with everything that's obviously going on in Ukraine. He took a big stance by taking this fight and he wants to do it as mm -hmm. a show of power and strength. So I think he'll be he'll be really going out there and looking for the stoppage this time. And I just think AJ with Robert Garcia, one of the things we mentioned, Maidana, Rios, etc. Leaky defence because they offer so much offence. And I think... AJ is going to have some holes there. And I do wonder, although we talk about Robert McCracken and, you know, perhaps not coming in with the best game plan for AJ in some of his fights, if it gets tough in there, AJ is going to be turning to Robert Garcia this time, who he's not really going to have that relationship with completely. I think, you know, that's going to be something where we're going to see a bit of a gut check from AJ in this one. So I, I can see Usyk taking him out late this time. I think he the way he turned it on in rounds 11 and 12 last time, he probably does that a little bit earlier this time. Yeah, I'm not sure what a trainer can do. I think it's a more mental issue with him. Um, mm -hmm. To be yeah. honest with you, he seems a bit gun shy. Seems yeah. a bit afraid to get hit. And again, a lot of Robert Garcia fighters, they're not afraid of being hit. They don't mm -hmm. have mental issues. They have a, a certain way of fighting. I don't know whether AJ can adopt his per style. And I know Robert Garcia has said that He's going to try to sort out the mental issue. I don't know how you do that, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Like, it's it's only AJ can kind of do it in the ring. Because yeah. it's like when you get put in that situation, it's like a driver, for example, that's had a really bad accident. It's only when you're in that situation, you're going to know whether yeah. he's able to overcome it. So I don't I don't see what Robert Garcia can do, to be honest with you. Yeah, I complete, I'm completely with you on that. I just don't see what what they can they can really do differently in this short amount of time. Tyson Fury says he wants five hundred million pounds to fight the winner, um, and that's the only way he's going to come out of retirement. What what do you make of Tyson Fury? Is kind of confusing me at the minute. I don't really understand what he's doing. He kind of comes out and contradicts himself, and says he said he said he's coming out of retirement. Then he said he wants five hundred million to fight the winner, which obviously. It's not realistic, you know, maybe 50, 60 million is realistic. But yeah, what do you make of Tyson Fury's comments? He just, I don't know. I don't think he even remembers what he said one day from the, to, to, to the next, really. I saw this morning that he was saying he wants exhibition fights against Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis, and that's the only thing that will get him out. But we saw the Frank Warren interview yesterday where mm. he said it's not, not nothing's about money anymore, but he would take a fight for, it has to be 500 million or whatever. I'm just, yeah, taking everything with a pinch of salt. And don't get me wrong, I think Tyson Fury would like to fight the both of them, but 
I do think he definitely looks at that Usyk fight with less intent than the AJ one. I think the AJ one definitely fuels him a little bit. I think the Usyk one, I know he calls him a blown up middleweight or whatever. He definitely looks at it and thinks that's not an easy fight. That's not to say he's ducking him or, or, you know, doesn't believe he can beat him. Of course he believes he can beat him, but he definitely looks at it and just doesn't fully fancy it because it's a, it's not, it's not a fun fight. It's not a, it's not a fight where Tyson Fury is going to knock him out and look, look brilliant like he did against White. It's going to be one of those fights, a bit like Waleen, where he's going to really come through some awkward moments and struggle. I've said, I've got a boxing group with my friends where we actually talk with Messenger, and I've openly said to them that Tyson Fury doesn't want to fight Alexander Usyk. It's quite mm -hmm. clear. I think these comments, he knows deep down how good Usyk is. And we're saying he's a blown up middleweight. He knows Alexander Usyk is a very, very good fighter. Um, I don't think he wants to go anywhere near him because. The problem is with boxing fans, we've already crowned him the best of this era without him having to fight the best of this. People are saying he's better than Ali, and which mm -hmm. is, in my opinion, absurd because yeah. this is a guy that's had five world title fights. Ali had 25. Um, it's like this is a problem with boxing fans. We crown somebody the king of this era without having without him having faced everyone of this era. How can you be crowned the best of this era without facing Usyk or even Joshua? And I think he would beat Joshua, to be honest with you. I, I think he'd beat... But at the end of the day, styles make fights. You have to fight everybody of your era to prove you're the best. Lennox did that. He beat everybody, really, when you think about it. I know we, Mike was past his best, but mm -hmm. still, Lennox was past his best and he still beat everybody of his era, so he was crowned the best. I think Fury's being crowned the best of his era, so he's thinking to himself... Why do I need to go into a fight with Usyk? People have already crowned me the best. If mm. I go in there and he beats me, I lose everything. He's got a lot more to lose than to gain fighting Usyk. And he knows that because most people expect him to beat Usyk. And he knows how good Usyk is because Fury is very intelligent. He's a very intelligent guy. He knows the, he knows yeah. what's in. He knows how good Usyk is. So I think it's a bit high risk, low reward in his eyes because he knows he can make a lot of money, like you said, doing exhibitions. Yeah, and I think he also looks at Usyk and he looks at AJ and knows exactly how he could push his buttons. He looked yeah. at Wilder, he looked at Klitschko and, and realised how he could push their buttons as well. He looks at Usyk, who just is stone cold when it gets to the the press conferences, the weigh-ins. He gives nothing away to his opponents. It's like just looking straight through him. He, he doesn't give you anything away. Saw that in the AJ fight. I thought we handled the whole fight week and the fight night better than AJ did, even mm -hmm. though AJ was the home the home fighter. Usyk was relaxed the whole time, walked to the ring, got to the ring and with the mask on and just was waiting for the fight to start. AJ was the one that looked a little bit on edge. I think Fury looks at Usyk and thinks, well, it's a tough stylistic matchup. I've struggled against that matchup before. He struggled with southpaws and also struggled against smaller guys like a Steve Cunningham. And then looks at him and thinks, well, I can't get in his head either. Is it of, is it really worth the risk at this stage for what is the reward? He thinks under, undisputed is obviously the best title in boxing, but he said it before. I've ha I've won every version of the world heavyweight title. What is undisputed to me? Holding them all at once. Mm, does he does he feel like he needs that? So I think you're right. There's just there's more ifs than absolutes with with taking that Usyk fight for him. Do you think it hurts his legacy? if he doesn't beat Usyk and Joshua? Do you think he can be compared to an Ali, to a Lewis, to some of the uh, Larry Holmes or some of the all-time great heavyweights if he doesn't beat Usyk or Joshua? It absolutely does if he doesn't face the winner of this fight. If mm. Joshua loses this fight and he never faces Joshua, don't get me wrong, it'll be sad for us, us Brits because it's a mm. huge fight, but yeah. he would have at least proven that he's kept up his end of the bargain by winning and Joshua's always always taken defeats and you can yeah, make yeah. that case. Mm. But if he turns around after this and doesn't fight the winner, you can't call yourself the best of, of this era. He doesn't need to beat Joshua and Usyk to prove that. Yeah, he yeah. needs to beat the winner of this fight because... Don't get me wrong, Fury's got things attached to his legacy that are great. I yeah. think of the Klitschko win away from home. I think of the first Deontay Wilder performance where he'd obviously been overweight and had his issues. The second fight where he did exactly what he said he was going to do and no one believed him. He's got great things in his career, but it's just not well-rounded enough and he hasn't beaten the other, the, the other top guy to prove it conclusively that he is the best. So he needs to do that. And if he doesn't, well, put an end to the talk that he's the best of this era.
Yeah, totally, totally agree with you. Totally, totally agree. I want to move on now and talk about something that was considered a shock, but really wasn't that big a shock. Um, it was a couple couple months now uh, when Canelo took on Dimitri Bivol and um, he got beat and he quite beat quite soundly, to be fair. Uh, firstly, how did you see that fight prior to it? Did you think Canelo would win or did you think it was a lot tougher than what a lot of people thought? Yeah, so I was actually in Vegas for the fight. It was my oh, really? my sort of yeah my, my dream opportunity to go and see a Vegas fight night. So I got to go to it, and I definitely felt Bivol was a problem for him. But I've always said I think to beat Canelo in Vegas, you're going to have to beat him pretty convincingly. So I was sort of erring on the side of Canelo wins a really close, difficult fight because of the kind of the the favoritism he tends to get. But I think it will be a close fight, a bit like Golovkin too. People think he won, some people think he won't, and it will be it will be that sort of fight. But watching it live, I said you need to dominate Canelo to win. Bivol did in the arena. It kind of felt like an eight four type fight. But I went back and watched it afterwards without the crowd and being surrounded by the sort of Mexican cheers. And I had it even wider. And I thought Bivol was just superb. He never let Canelo set himself. He never let Canelo work at his own pace. He boxed at his own pace, which is is something people really struggle with Canelo. A lot of people that fight him as well, like Callum Smith, who's six foot four and he's big and he's strong, almost make themselves small and fight to Canelo's height and, and give here give away all their advantages. Bivol didn't box like the bigger, stronger, faster, more athletic, like heavyweight in there and got the job done. And I was really, really impressed with it. Yeah, do you do you give him much of a chance in the rematch? Obviously, he's going to fight Golovkin in September, and then look to fight Bivol in May. Apparently, according to reports, do you think he's got any chance in that rematch? Do you think he can beat him? What do you think he needs to do in order to beat him in the rematch? I think if it's at one seven five again, I I, I favour Bivol. I think it really wasn't. He Canelo just didn't have any advantages at that weight. He's usually mm. quicker. He's usually stronger, and he just wasn't in any way. Um, I do think if he can make the fight on his terms, if he says to Bivol, how about an opportunity of becoming undisputed, you come down to 168 and meet me there. He sort of balls Bivol down a little bit. Perhaps he takes away some of his advantages and then I would give Canelo more of a chance. But if it is at 175, I think it's a repeat. Um, I think in terms of what he needs to do, I think he just got his tactics wrong in believing that he could box the same way he boxed Caleb Plant Billy Joe, Callum Smith, he thought he could just walk Bivol down. And Bivol was much smarter than those guys, much stronger than those guys. Yeah. Canelo had some actual good success at times when he was sort of not trying to constantly walk Bivol down and trying to have it a little bit more at mid-range. And he was actually picking his shots in, I think, the first two rounds and also the ninth or tenth, which he won as well. I think that's where he started to have a bit more success. But if he just tries to, if he lets Bivol dictate the tempo again, Canelo can't match it with that added weight because he's not a natural 175. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. I would pick Bivol in the in the rematch as well. I think Bivol is his performance there was exceptional. The way he controlled that fight was unbelievable. His footwork, yeah, the way he was he was just brilliant. I, I didn't expect him. Like I saw his fight against Richards and he was kind of underwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um I wasn't that impressed against Richards and I said there's no way this guy's going to beat Canelo Alvarez. And then I started going into his amateur background and then started watching more of more footage of him. And he was like, OK, this guy's a serious problem if he can get it right all on the night. And he did. He put it everything right on the night and he just totally, totally outclassed Canelo, really. And Canelo was mm -hmm. kind of, can I, you could see after the fight that Canelo looked, he knew he had lost that fight. You yeah. know, he knew he had lost that fight towards the end of the fight. It wasn't close. I, I could say some people say Golovkin uh, beat Canelo. I, uh, in the first fight, I thought Golovkin won. In the second fight, I thought Canelo won. But yeah. they were relatively close-ish fights. This was quite... He dominated him, really. And Canelo's <laughs> at the top of his game. For someone to do that, he has to be an exceptional fighter, irrespective of how big he is and the weight and stuff. He's an exceptional fighter. There is a narrative, though, Jamie. I know you've probably seen it in America. That Canelo's ducking Charlo, Benavidez. You've probably seen, you've probably seen this uh, on Facebook and on, on YouTube channels. There, They said Canelo's been ducking these guys, Andrade, for years. I do want to get your opinion on that and what you think, because for me, a lot of these guys are waiting for a Canelo fight and they're not fighting each other. Uh, what do you make of the American scene, these guys saying that Canelo's been ducking these guys for ages? 
it winds me up every single time. Um, it, he, is Canelo ducking them to then take on a much harder fight in Dimitri Bivol? If Dimitri yeah. Bivol's this cherry pick, everyone says he is. Yeah. Why doesn't Benavidez and Charlo go up to one seven five and face him? Because they'll lose even more conclusively than oh, yeah. than Canelo did. So I hate it. I hate that sort of talk. Um, and listen, I mean, if you're going to throw around those narratives, is David Benavidez ducking Plant? Is Plant ducking Benavidez? Is Charlo ducking Benavidez? To me, Charlo doesn't want the Benavidez fight at all. No. He'll be happy to get drunk at ringside and then and then yeah. have a go at him. But then when it actually comes down to making it, they price themselves out of it. Even if you look at Andrade against Benavidez, Benavidez's team turning around and saying they want six to eight million for that fight. Yeah. Or whatever. Those guys need to get it on. Prove you're the best of that bunch. Yeah, and then to prove you're worthy to face Canelo because Canelo will eventually face these guys and yeah, he yeah. will win and he will win yeah. clearer than those people expect and yeah. then the, the narrative will change again it will go back to oh, he's a drugs cheat that's the reason he won or yeah. whatever it's just yeah. Canelo can't win in, in some people's eyes I want to get your opinion on Andre and Charlo um, Andre and Charlo literally like respect to Jamel Who's mm -hmm. cleaned out a division and literally he should be, he should be on the pound for pound list. He's a great fighter. Um, even though he's got a loss and a draw, I still think he I think he should be on the pound for pound list. I actually think he's pretty disrespected. He doesn't mm -hmm. ever get a shout on the pound for pound list. He's undisputed and he's fought everybody really. And now he's looking to fight Tim Tazu. But Jamal, on the other hand, and um, Andre, these are guys that have been around for a very long time. And they're yet to fight one elite fighter in their whole career. Mm -hmm. um Andred is a damn shame what's happened to him what what do you make of their whole career and what's going on the fact that Andred was coming here to fight Zach Parker then pulled out of that fight through injuries um Charlo was meant to fight Selecki he pulled out of that fight what 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 do you make of all, all that's happening with their careers yeah I mean firstly to talk about Jamal I mean we saw him once last year once a year before and I mean this year we don't know what's going to happen now but if it gets past August we're only going to see him once this year as well I mean Derevchenko was a good fight but the Montiel fight last year where he actually struggled didn't make weight properly either and then comes into the Selecki fight as well which no one wants to see I mean that's two years in a row of nothing fights for him in the peak of his career really he's not going to get better years as an athlete than than where he's at now so especially when you look at what his twin brothers do and you just mentioned it like we've got someone we can hold him up against as a standard like Jamel although he's taken his losses has gone back in rematches and left no doubt I mean his performance against Castano in the rematch one of the best performances of the year yeah, yeah, he yeah. he just constantly wants to challenge himself he could quite easily right now vacate those belts move up to 160 could fight an Adames or someone like that just a a sort of run-of-the-mill middleweight, someone that's decent but not elite. But instead, he's choosing to stay at 154 and fight the best possible mandatory that's available. I mean, he's got Fundora there as well. He may even take him on afterwards if he beats Tim Zhu. The guy just wants all the smoke. So we've got someone that we can directly put Jamal up against, uh, Jamal up against, and he just doesn't. He doesn't fall through with it, and he's. He's talking about these fights with David Benavidez. He's talking about these fights with Caleb Plant. It's, it seems like it's all talk, no action. For Andrade, it's a bit of a different story, really. I do think he got a little bit unlucky. I think Eddie Hearn was struggling to deliver him any meaningful fights. One thing that I think doesn't help is that Eddie had Golovkin, but he'd promised Golovkin the biggest fights possible. And I don't think Golovkin, Team Golovkin, deemed Andrade that. So I just think Andrade's been a bit unlucky with his management and stuff, but he's now in a point where he's got free of that. By all accounts, he's had offers from PBC. Go out there and make the fights happen now because Andrade really is, I mean, what is he, 33, 34 getting towards? I mean, he's at a point now where he, he has to strike now where he's going to be he's going to be getting worse and worse. So just disappointing. When you look at that middleweight division, it's been the, it's easily been the most frustrating division over the past five or so years because the just the champions just haven't faced each other mm, yeah i totally agree i totally agree by the way do you think andre would be um charlo and benavidez uh i'm not so sure about benavidez i really rate benavidez especially at 168 um yeah. he's big strong super middleweight and andrade would be moving up mm. i've always liked him against charlo i thought mm. he's a better boxer than charlo i think jamal's uh jamal's a little bit more athletic um probably a little bit more of the explosive puncher as well. But Andrade can 
the thing is with Entrade, because he's fought so much poor opposition, he's kind of fought down to their level a little bit. But you see him burst when he actually fights to his actual level. He's a really talented fighter, really, really tricky to beat. So I'd pick him to beat Charlo. I wouldn't pick him to beat Benavidez. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with you on that. I, I I would actually pick him to beat Benavidez. I'm not very high on Benavidez. I've been pretty critical. I think he's been fighting pretty poor opposition. I'm not so convinced. I think he's technically not the best. Mm -hmm. I think he's pretty flat-footed. He's got fast hands, yes, but he's pretty flat-footed. But again, like you said, with Andre as well, he's a smaller guy. Liam Williams gave him some trouble in that fight mm -hmm. uh, towards the back end where Andre looked like he was gassing. Benavidez is a bigger puncher than Liam Williams, a much bigger guy, better fighter. So that, that could be a very difficult fight. I do think that Andre would outbox Benavidez, but I don't know how long he could do it for. Yeah, Maybe. that's the, the thing. Yeah. Yeah. But the last topic I want to talk about is obviously the big fight this weekend, or you could call it a big fight, a unification fight, three belt fight. Uh, Arthur Betebiev takes on Joe Smith. And I've seen your breakdown for this. So I know who you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're backing. But yeah, I'm going to ask you again anyway. Uh, how do you see this fight playing out? Who do you think wins? And do you want to see the winner fight Bivol? Absolutely the winner to fight yeah. Bivol, first and foremost. Yeah. yeah, I think outside of Spence and Crawford, I actually think that's that's the oh, fight yeah. at boxing. I mean, two undefeated guys in, in the light heavyweight oh, division. Yeah. In a division that's quite weak as well outside of it. I mean, yeah, top yeah, yeah. two are really above, so you need to see that. Mm -hmm. In terms of who I think is going to win it, um, I do lean towards Baterbiev. I have said, though, in my own video that I think Joe Smith Jr. actually matches up really well with him because the mm -hmm. only times we've seen Baterbiev in genuine, genuine trouble is early on in fights against big punchers. Mm -hmm. and Joe Smith Jr. is a big puncher. Um, he's technically sound as well. He's not a bad fighter by any means. Um, he's definitely you know, earned his world title, although he may have got a bit of the rub of the green in, in the world title fight against Vlasov. Mm -hmm. He definitely earned being in that position and, and having yeah. that belt. Um, so he's dangerous, very dangerous early on. And it wouldn't surprise me if Baterbiev perhaps gets rocked early on or perhaps even goes down because his conditioning so good that he recovers quite quickly. So he'll always yeah. get back up and go again. But I just think ultimately you accumulate so much damage against Baterbiev that I was watching the Vozdik fight back the other day and mm -hmm. you get to a point where not even can you, your arms are that sore and you're that beaten up and bruised that you can throw back. You can't even defend yourself properly. I mean, Marcus Brown, at the point of the stoppage, just just gave up, just basically yeah. just went down and was like, I can't physically take this yeah. anymore. But Terbiev throws really sneaky shots, the kind of through the middle, and he doesn't have to load up and throw big shots like Joe Smith does. He can just throw it from his elbow or, you know, be right and close in the clinch and it will hurt. It will just take the wind out of you. I think Baterbiev will break him down eventually and get him out of there. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. I, I think Bet Betebiev reminds me, Betebiev reminds me of like Khabib, the way he yeah. slowly dismantles guys and just beats them up and beats them into submission. Like I, I watched that Marcus Brown fight and the Govzik fight. They almost kind of g gave up, not gave up in the sense that they quit, but yeah. just didn't have anything left because they had been beaten up so badly. It's like he takes you into deep waters and drowns you and just he just he beats you up. Like he's he is a monster. You know, the word monster, like Benavidez gets called the Mexican monster, and he genuinely is a monster. Like, I think he's a quality fighter, great amateur as well. Um, great pressure fighter, very skilled, very high skilled pressure fighter, very difficult to find pressure fighters with very high skill. Golovkin was one, he's another one. That's very, very skilled. Um, and he, he kind of cuts off the ring on you and he gives you no exits. There's nowhere for you to go. Um, people say his footwork isn't that great. I think his footwork is brilliant, the way he cuts off the ring. Um, mm -hmm. I think he's the best light heavyweight in the world. Uh, I'm going to come to it. Um, Bivol v. Betabiev. How do you see that one? Yeah, again, I I just... I can't see many boxers be like being able to outbox him over twelve rounds because you, like I say, you just pick up too much damage. And yeah. you think of the shots that he caught from Canelo. We saw after the fight that Bivol's like biceps were yeah, swollen, yeah. and he yeah, took yeah. a lot of shots, and he stood up to them well. If he takes those same shots against Baterbiev, it's a different story. The guy just hits so hard. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's freakish. You watch fighters like. You think over the last couple of years, it's kind of been a new A and Wilder that we talk about as the other yeah, two yeah. most dangerous punchers before that yeah. Golovkin. 
with those guys, it's kind of over in an instant. You can get clipped yeah. by a new A and Wilder and you're asleep and then that's it. Yeah. With Baturbiev, he rarely folds people in a matter of minutes and knocks them out clean. Like you say, he, he takes away your self-belief. Like, I think mm -hmm. most boxers, it takes an awful lot for them to ever feel like they're completely out of a fight. He does. Mm -hmm. And I, I do wonder whether he'd do the exact same to, to Bivol. The one thing I'd say, I think Bivol has a better work rate than Vosdick did. I think he's able mm -hmm. to box at a fast pace more consistently. His volume's very good. His footwork's better than Vosdick as well. And it has to be said, Vosdick um, had lost to Baturbiev in the amateurs. Yeah. So he had a bit of a bit of yeah. a fear. He knew how hard he hit. So he probably went in there a bit scared. I don't think Bivol would go in with the same fear. So it's very, very close. And it has to be said that, you know, Baturbiev voted it was actually close before the point of the stoppage. Baturbiev started to take over in those later rounds. But be interesting. Baturbiev's no spring chicken. He's 37. He's getting yeah. old. He's had a lot of injuries. He's not been particularly active. I do think Baturbiev, one day we will watch and he'll just suddenly decline. Yeah. It will be one of those overnight sort of declines. It won't be gradual. You'll just see it in him. So who knows? Depends when the fight is. Just hope it happens. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully we we need the Crawford Spence fight as well. That's another one that we really need that's to be honest. Priority, with you. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a massive fight, and there's talking about that happening. Who do you have that? One? Who would you see winning that one, Crawford Spence? I've always uh, lent more towards Crawford. Um, I just think his ability to adapt is something that's quite unique and something that's incredibly special. I yeah. think in pretty much all his fights, he shows that he makes. He makes adjustments and he makes them to an extremely high level. Um, I think of the Porter fight, a lot of people had that really close, but I genuinely thought after the sixth round, Crawford saw something and made an adjustment and then kind of was quite quite in control afterwards. Um, I think Crawford's inside strength is really deceptive. I thought Porter didn't have his way at all on the inside. I think Crawford's kind of wrestling background, those long arms. He's got freakish strength. And I think his ability to box a, a ridiculously high standard in Southpaw is also a factor in that fight because Spence has, has been, you know, hasn't fought many Southpaws in his pro career. He's sort of made a, a career at the top end of fighting a lot of orthodox fighters and he's able to sort of get on their chest, set about them, throw the left hook to the body. I think Crawford's ability to be an incredible outfighter in Southpaw is the difference in that fight. If he boxes orthodox early on like he usually does and he starts a bit slow, Spence will come into it. I think Crawford just seems to have a gear that I'm I'm not sure many fighters in the sport currently quite have. I think maybe Crawford, Usyk, and then you maybe look at Inoue as well, but he never goes long enough for us to really see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I don't know. Crawford's just always struck me that he might just have that little something special to beat Spence, but it's a, yeah. it's a real toss up. It wouldn't surprise me if Spence went out on one. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. I, I was kind of like 50-50 on Spence and Crawford. One minute I was, I was favoring Spence, and after the accident, I was favoring Crawford. Then I saw Spence dismantle Ugas, and I was like, Spence. Uh, I, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, it's a really good matchup. Yeah. I don't think you can be confident either way. Uh, I, I generally, don't, I generally don't know, and that's why we need to see it. That's yeah. why it needs to be made. Um, but yeah, Jamie, it's been great having you on. I really appreciate. It. Is there anything you want to add, by the way? No, not at all, mate. Thank you very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. And yeah, we'll get you on get you on my channel as well. Yeah, I'll do a Thursday definitely. night live show, so it'd be good to have you on there. Yeah, definitely, mate. Whenever you want me to come on, I'd, I'd come on. Uh, just give me a shout on Messenger and I'm more than happy to come on. Cool. Nice uh, one, mate. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Cheers, Cheers Jamie. Appreciate it. Um, guys, go give Jamie a, a sub. Um, his channel is Punch Perfect Boxing. I'll leave the... I'll leave the... Uh, I'll attach his um, profile name in my description. Awesome. Uh, and I'll also put um, a comment out in the co community tab um, showing his channel. So, yeah, uh, appreciate that, Jamie. Thanks for coming okay. on. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Appreciate it. Take care.